Connecting the SWAC, the MEAC, SIAC, and the CIAA. The HBCU experience lives here. It's the HBCU Report with Rob Calloway on News and Talk 1380, WAOK, and WAOK.com. This is the HBC Report on News and Talk 1380, WAOK. And, uh, you know, we've been talking over the past few weeks about the way that uh, HBCUs have been selling out for a dollar, so to speak. And so last week, as we talked at the beginning of the show, last week was what I call Slaughter Week. We had three historical black colleges and universities uh, take on three of the big boys. You had Ohio State and FAMU in action. Ohio State defeated FAMU 76 nothing. Uh, Florida State defeated Bethune Cookman 54 to six, and then uh, University of Miami slaughtered Savannah State 77 seven. And so I was reading an article by a guy that I truly admire, and uh, he joins us on the line right now, George Curry, who is the editor in chief of the NNPA News Service. Uh, first of all, George, thank you for joining us on the HBCU Report. Glad to be a part of it. All right, so just to give folks some background on you, you actually. Uh, started your career as a columnist for Sports Illustrated, correct? Yes, yes, I sure did. That was my first job in journalism in 1970, a long time ago. And I know you also wrote a book uh, back in 1977, Jake Gaither, America's Most Famous Black Coach. Uh, what inspired you to do that? Now, as you know, Gaither won 85% of his game over 25 years and never had a uh, losing season. So I wrote a lot about Jake and talked about Eddie Robinson at Grambling and John Merritt at Tennessee State, those were the big three back in the, in the glory days of black college football. This is the HBCU Report. Rob Calloway on the line right now with George Curry. He is the editor-in-chief for the NNPA News Service. And we're talking about the article that he wrote this week, are black colleges selling out for a dollar uh, in response to last week's slaughters. And so, George, you know, I was going to come on the air this week and just rant and rave uh, about the way these uh, HBCU teams had to take these butt whippings. But, of course, I do understand that they need the money to uh, finance the other athletic programs outside of football. But now that I have you on and don't have to rant and rave, I can have an intelligent conversation about it. Uh, What are your thoughts on on schools actually having to take these games in order for their athletic programs to survive? Well, first of all, uh, I'm a product of HBCU. I went to Knoxville College in Tennessee. Play football, play quarterback, co-captain football team, play football in high school in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Durham High School. So I am a former athlete. Uh, wrote for Sports Illustrated, as you said, my first job. So I love football. I love HBCUs. And it's absolutely embarrassing. I, I'm, I'm sitting there watching the scores. I see Ohio State 76, FAMU 0. Florida State 54, Bethune Cookman 6. Miami 77, Savannah State 7. The, look, these athletes on the predominant white schools uh, back in the 50s and 60s couldn't go to the, certainly in the South and the SEC, couldn't go to any of those schools. And so now those athletes who they would have gone to black college are now with these predominant white institutions. And I don't knock that at all, but I think that in the heyday, I think uh, Sam U and Tennessee State and Grandma could have beat many of these schools when they didn't have, white, uh, have black players. But now it's so uh, way the other way. And to me, to go out and play these schools and, and to do it for a dollar, I think sells out that rich tradition. Uh, I don't think there's any amount of money that's worth the public humiliation. This is the HBCU Report. Rob Calloway being joined live on the line right now by George Curry. He is the editor-in-chief for the NNPA News Service. Also, an author has a book uh, that he wrote back in the day about Jake Gaither, the, uh, the famed Florida a and University head football coach, who, by the way, uh, I had an uncle that actually played for Jake Gaither back in the day, and so I'm very familiar with the legacy and the rich tradition of football down at Florida and m University and, and, you know, being a product myself of an HBCU, Alabama State University. Uh, it, it is, it's kind of embarrassing because when I was in school, and, I, and I'm a lot younger than you, George. I have to admit that. I have to, you know. That's all right. That's all right. I, uh, be, be, be happy. But, <laughs> you know <what> I am. <laughs> but, uh, but the one thing that I don't remember when I was in school, I don't remember us having to take these, these kind of games for, you know, for financial purposes. I think the, the, the biggest school that we might have seen back in the 90s was Troy State University, which really wasn't that big at the time. Um, mm-hmm. but, but in this piece that you wrote, you talked about how the youth of today 
I uh, don't know about the glory days of black college football back in the, the, the early 70s, the 60s, the 50s. And I talked to um, James Harris last week, James Shaq Harris, former Grambling State University uh, yep, quarterback. Absolutely. And, and, mm-hmm. and we talked about it, and I was asking him, what was, you know, does, does he blame, you know, the African-American kids, the kids in general, for wanting to play on the biggest stage in the biggest games. And he said he wasn't mad, but he just felt like, you know, they weren't, they, they were not exposed to the full story. What do you think about that? Right. Well, look, look, look at uh, what has come out of these black colleges. Jerry Rice, arguably the best wide receiver in history in the NFL. He went to Mississippi Valley. Walter Payton has the rank up there with any great running back. He went to Jackson State. You had uh, Richard Dent and uh, Tutal Jones at Tennessee State. Bob Hayes, the world's fastest human, uh, 64 Olympics. Willie Gallimore with the Sam U. And Don Driver, who's playing the Packers now. And Steve McNair went to Alcorn. I mean, you can go down the list. These were tremendous athletes, obviously well coached. Although the coaches didn't get a chance to coach at the white school or the NFL, they were coached and they had all kinds of talent on these teams. This, this is the best way to imagine, Rob. Imagine if you're in the state of Florida. And you had all the black players who went to the University of Florida, all the black players who went to Florida State, all the black players who went to Miami, and they all were the same team. That's a national championship. That's a, okay, that's exactly what Dick Gates had every year at FAMU. The best of the best. Bob Hayes was on the bench, and when he did get off the bench, he was a part of There was so much talent and so deep. So the talent has always been there, and so... If anybody go back and look at the and, and the bands, people come to just to listen to the bands at halftime because they would be battling it out. And so that's a rich, rich tradition. And I hate to see it spoiled by these spectacles on Saturdays where they get a lot of money for doing it. To me, it's just not worth it. This is the HBCU Report. Rob Calloway on the line right now with George Curry. He is the editor-in-chief uh, of the NNPA News Service uh, talking HBCU football and whether or not we are selling ourselves out for the almighty dollar. And, um, I, again, I, going back to your piece that you wrote, and I was, and, again, it wasn't a long read, but, you know, I, I was enlightened by some of the things that, that you put in here because there was uh, one particular player that I was not familiar with that actually you, you use as the catalyst for what ended up happening, basically the big schools going in and pilfering the talent out from the HBCUs. And uh, you mentioned that, uh, had it not been for uh, Sam Cunningham, who ran for 135 yards and two touchdowns on 12 carries back in 1970 when uh, USC beat Alabama 42-21, that the SEC might might not have, you know, brought in black players as soon as they did. No question about it. And, see, that was in my hometown. You went to Alabama State. I'm from Tuscaloosa. So the University of Alabama is in Tuscaloosa. And I saw all these all-white teams grow up, little white teams playing the University of Alabama. And, of course, they were beating everybody in the SEC because all white. But when they started competing against black players, they saw they were too slow. They couldn't keep up. And so Sam the Bam Cunningham came, ran all over Alabama in their home state. And that's why Brian said, hey, we can't keep going like we're going if we want to win and we want to be competitive. And that's the only reason they really desegregated football in the SEC. Now the SEC has a lock almost every year. The national championship comes from the SEC. And they're doing it. Now, imagine all those teams. Look, you look out there and look at Alabama play now. It's almost like you're watching a UNCF school out there. Yeah. Uh, because look at all the black players, whether it's football and basketball. Look at all of them. Can you imagine any of those teams playing now without the black players they have on that team? Yeah, they wouldn't win. Would they, they wouldn't be successful. They wouldn't be the same way. And they understood that, too. I don't knock anybody who goes to, to a brown up white school. I'm saying in the day, what the talent was, it was all stacked up on these black schools, and the quality was good, as good as anybody. In fact, the first game between a black school was FAMU playing Tampa, and FAMU won. And that really broke the barrier, because before then, the question was, are these uh, players good enough? Are they good enough to compete against white players? Where in 1969, we finally got the answer. FAMU won the game, and that ended that argument. This is the HBCU Report. Rob Calloway being joined right now by George Curry. He is the editor-in-chief of the NNPA News Service, uh, talking about a most recent piece that he wrote, Selling Out Black College Football to Make a Buck, uh, and something that we've been talking about over the past 
uh, two or three weeks right here on the HBCU report. Now, um, what what do we have to do in order to either revive or educate our youth on the legacies of guys like Jake Gaither, the legendary Eddie Robinson, and also uh, Big John Mayer? Well, people have to read and know that there is, there is information out there. Uh, a friend of mine, Vern Smith, down in Atlanta, is, uh, has written a script based on my book, which tells the story of, of black college football. We're trying to get that now made into a movie, a TV movie, and I think that's how you reach a lot of young people. Y'all, a lot of young people will not read, but if they saw that movie, they may be running to the books and see those those kind of stories. But the information is there for them to read. They can still get my book on Amazon. They can read my column on blackpressusa.com. The one we talked about is on blackpressusa.com. It appears in most of the black newspapers around the country. And so I think the larger problem is trying to save our colleges, period, our black colleges, period. Uh, you look at, you still got uh, roughly a third of all African Americans coming from uh, historical black colleges, and you look at our leadership, it's even greater than that. So I would trade nothing. For my HBCU experience, I think people can go to grad school wherever they want, but if my choice, uh, my, my choice, my nephews and nieces, if they ask me, go to a black college undergraduate, there's nothing like it. You'll have friends there for a lifetime, and you'll love your school. A lot of my friends go to the large school, go to the University of Alabama now, which I couldn't do when I was growing up. They, now they go there, and they, they never want to go back because they don't feel that they have anything special about it. It's not their school. So I cherish our schools, but I don't think we support them enough. So we can't talk about the football in the back and the athletics in the back. we got to talk about supporting our HBCU. All right, and there it is, folks. He is George Curry, the editor-in-chief of the NNPA News Service. George, sir, tell everyone where they can read your stuff. Well, you two places, uh, any, uh, blackpressusa.com, blackpressusa.com, one word, has uh, out my column and also the works for all, going from all, all our black newspapers. And, and my personal website is georgecurry.com, C-U-R-R-Y, georgecurry.com. I also have my column and write in there as well. All right, once again, thank you so much, George, and we look forward to talking to you down the road right here on the HBCU Report. Absolutely, and thank you for all you're doing, because we need it. I really appreciate you.